Oh, he's behind me. Good afternoon. It's gratifying, not unexpected to see so many out today to say goodbye to one of them. One who was a friend and a mentor to so many of us. Thank you, Wendy, for permitting me a few moments to speak about the man who taught me so much and was my best friend to boot. Like the others who will speak today, I will talk about the learner that I knew about. Some of you may know that I like to write, and Werner gave me so much to write about. <laughs> His name came up in at least six chapters of my book. Yeah. And with stories about flying here in the Pacific Northwest and as far east as Oshkosh. Most he liked, but there were occasions when he would flip me the bird. <laughs> Butcher, baker, candlestick maker. One out of three is not bad. Werner was but Werner was many other things. He was a baker, but also flight instructor, an air traffic controller, an antique aircraft restorer, a Model A airplane and hot rod builder. A man of many talents, and one who was willing to share his knowledge, talent, and time with anyone who would show an interest. Born in Bavaria in southern Germany in June of 1943, he moved to Canada with his parents in the early 1950s, eventually arriving in Michigan, where his father started a bakery. It all ended November the 12th, 2023, when at 9.45 p.m. he surrendered to the cancers after so many years of fighting. In the early days, he worked for his father in the bakery, pulling the early shift, 3 a.m. until whenever, earning the money that went to flying lessons in 1964 in Abbotsford. He worked as a flying instructor from 1966 to 1970, and that included a stint of running a remote school in Powell River. Later in 1970, he joined Transport Canada and worked in RTC initially in Abbotsford, and then here in Langley, and then back to Abbotsford until he retired in 2000. He and Wendy built a log home in Aldergrove and later added a small shop. When his neighbor needed a bigger shop for his trucks, Werner negotiated a deal to get the smaller one. This he added on the back of the original, lifting it over the fence with a crane, thus increasing his shop space by more than 125%. Now that he had the front for a paint shop and the back for covering, each could stay clean. His passion for uh, flying included the mechanical side of completing award-winning restorations of at least five J5, J3 Cubs, as well as the Porterfield in 1981 and the Fairchild in 1991. His craftsmanship was acknowledged with a variety of awards from his peers at Delta Air Park, Arlington, Washington, Hood River, Oregon, and as far away as Merced, California, and Oshkosh in Wisconsin. He obtained his air freight license in the 1980s, allowing him then to do annuals and sign out his own work. He and Dan Halliday together built a Mark Art Charger, and he assisted on the construction of Dan's Piper. He played a major role in the completion of Jim Britton's Staggerwing. He even found some time to help me with my Stinson, both in painting and in an engine change, as well as many, many annuals. His most recent and last job was Cam Leslie's J3 Cup which has the distinction of being the oldest Canadian-built cub in existence. He gave many area pilots their tailwheel checkouts, including yours truly, insisting on only three-point landings and laughing madly when the things would go a little bit sideways. In my case, these included his Porterfield and the Museum's Finch. He also checked me out on the Mooney Mite, a single-seat retractable aircraft. This little this was memorable in the method that he used. Together, we picked up this little plane and set it on some sawhorses so that I could figure out where the important stuff was and how to, to retract and lower the gear all under his supervision. He taught many supply tail draggers. Some are here today, and they include the whole gamut of aviation from private pilots and those who went on to become commercial pilots with careers in both corporate Air aviation and with the airlines. He taught me and many others how to hand start an airplane. And for those who know how that is done, part of the call of the pilot is the status 
of the night switches. Most of us will call it switches off when the person coughing will pull it through a few times. We're going to use a different terminology, and I quote, switches say off. There's a good reason for this, as one day he was starting a coup, heard the call, switches off, pulled the blade through, the engine started, and a blade struck him on the head. This could have been fatal. And of course, while it was painful, and not just a little embarrassing for a high-time instructor, what was even more embarrassing was the resulting and inevitable nickname, Piggy Bank, from the slot on his head. <laughs> he was a director of the Canadian Museum of Flight here in Langley, and for a period applied his expertise in both maintenance of flying the Waco Cabin, the Fleet Finch, the Tiger Moth, and when the Mooney Mite was sold, he delivered it to the new owner of Washington State. The Arlington Air Show benefited from his expertise as a judge in the antique and classic, uh, antique and classic areas. His skills were acknowledged by many all over the Pacific Northwest. It was impossible to go anywhere with him and not meet some of his many friends and associates. Most recently at Payne Field, where we ran into a fellow Fairchild 24 restorer, air race pilot John Penny, who incidentally flies a MiG-29 Fulcrum for Paul Allen in his spare time, another who had traded his vampire for a tutor, and of course John Sessions, the owner of the historic flight museum, who had questions on how to sort out his stagger wing. The Abbotsford Air Show saw him participate in many flight paths, either in one of his own classics or the museum's biplanes, he was an early supporter of the Young Eagles program and helped organize first flights for over some 700 kids uh, here in Langley. He personally flew in excess of 100. These are just some of his accomplishments, and I'm sure you'll hear from others today. In closing, Wendy, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to say goodbye to my brother, my best friend, and the brother that I've ever had. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. Uh, speaking of mics, um, Michael, please back corners. Number two, son, he's going to come up here and say a few words in regards to his dad. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, just some stories. Um, Remember, like, growing up and uh, earliest memory is us trying to go back and think about their, what they were. And, like, we had a house on Broadway Avenue in Abbotsford, and in the basement there was a model train set that my dad built and had like, a big mountain that the train went through. Um, he had always helped me and my brother set up like Tyco racetracks around uh, the house. Um, he built us a really cool tree house um, at the same place on Broadway and I remember falling out of it and falling out of trees and breaking arms and legs. Um, uh, <laughs> um, he would take me and my brother camping to uh, the KOA in Washington and um, try to get us to go fishing and we, I think we did probably a couple times, but we always ripped around on our bikes doing good things. Um, and of course, all the airplane stories, um, you know, we've been lots of places. I remember in Concrete, Washington, I think it might have been their last fly-in, um, going there and just seeing him and his element and um, all the people that knew him. Uh, anytime you bumped into someone who knew planes, they usually knew my dad. Um, spent lots of hours in the shop, uh, hangers. Um, sorry, <laughs> I'll make it through this. Um, just wanted to say, let's speed this up here. Um, when he first got sick, it was like eight years ago, he tried to make a point to uh, see him as much as possible. And uh, yeah, we got a gift because he was so stubborn and kept fighting. So we got many more years than I thought we'd have. And um, just wanted to say how amazing what he was. It's just the amount of patience and uh, how kind she was. Um, especially towards 
So like, when do you, uh, you call and ask me if I didn't see this and I asked her the first thing I said, is there something that you'd like to get up and say? And she was, I don't think I want to get up and talk. <laughs> And so I've been pushing her for about three weeks now to give me something, and uh, she got here and she, she had everything focused and she gave me this to read, so uh, I'm going to try my best. Um, some 40 plus years ago, Wendy first met Warner. Anywhere else, where could it be? It was an airplane function. They were set up as a blind date, and I think Wendy was the only one that was blind that day. Um, <laughs> I think it was a little, a little light as I came here. Uh, so I don't start crying. Um, and it was, uh, it was for an aerobatic competition, and they had a wind-up banquet there, and Warner was a volunteer starter for the airplanes. Uh, he made sure that the switch was off. <laughs> um, after that, they attended uh, numerous other fly-ins where they met many lifelong friends. Uh, Evergreen Fly-In uh, was an annual flight that they also attended with a group of Langley pilots. Um, and I guess that was about 1982 that this all transpired because Wendy and I had spoken about the, getting the L4 Piper Cup VEW resurrected from its wreck in Stave Lake, where Warner thought he'd park it. Um, and then my dad Marv bought it and they rebuilt it. And it was just after that that Wendy and Warner met, I believe, uh, which would have been sometime after May of 1982. Uh, as you know, Warner's life was an airplane uh, nut. Uh, anything about airplanes. Um, and their home was on the flight path to Langley Airport. And he would look up. As they passed and called out their ident, and he would call out their ident. Of course, Wendy couldn't didn't know if he was really if he was really actually calling the airplane out as what it was, or he just figured he would yell out a name. <laughs> but he 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 actually used to state that he could tell what airplane it was from by the sound of the engine. And of course, Wendy really didn't know if you really knew what aircraft it was, uh, but now it's become a habit for her to look up in the sky when she hears an airplane overhead, and she can recognize, even she can recognize some of them. And she calls it learning through osmosis. And she'd like to thank everybody for coming out and uh, enjoying this beautiful day of celebration. Uh, I'm gonna continue on here. Um, <clears throat> As we get older, we kind of lose our timelines, but thanks to uh, Leroy Klingwall and I, I think I kind of put together where Warner entered my life. At, and we believe it was somewhere in the mid 60s, but the most, uh, the memory that I remember the most was, uh, it was probably the fall of 67 or early 68, Warner had, uh, was living in Maple Ridge in a basement suite while he was working at Pitt. And we're not really sure if he was getting his full instructor's license then or it was right around that same time, but he was going to Vancouver. And for some reason, my mom and dad couldn't take care of me. And I wasn't in school yet, I was about five. So about seven o'clock in the morning, my mom got into her little Volkswagen bug and dropped me off at Warner's place. And he was babysitting me for the day. I bet he really enjoyed that. <laughs> so I took this little five-year-old kid who just never shut up and was always annoying. And it's, I'm still kind of that guy. Um, and he loaded me into this beautiful, brand new 1965 Plymouth Barracuda, gold on gold on gold. And I think it was the first person under the age of 25 that I ever got to ride in it. He was about 23 or 24 at the time, I guess. And off we went to Vancouver, and then it was lunchtime, and I was hungry, so we pulled into an AMW and, and uh, oh, let me have a baby burger in his brand new car, and you could tell he was a little apprehensive about it, but he did anyways. And um, then on the way home, he uh, let me go to the very back and the big glass on those 65 Barracudas. The sun was coming down and I fell asleep and he delivered me safely home. And that was the day I found my hero. Yes, he was Superman to me. And uh, I'm sure that you guys all probably have similar thoughts about who Warner was. Um, but yeah, he was, he was my first hero. And, 
Um, I got to sit with him the night before he passed, and he still was. And I hope you guys have those kind of memories, too. Um, what, what are you going to do next? I'm going to get uh, Mike up again, or Dan, what do you guys want to come up next? Okay, Dan's coming up. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is Dan Holiday. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is not going to be a speech. I'm just going to go through some uh, recollections of things that Werner did around the airport to show <coughs> he, loved, <coughs> he loved airplanes and he loved people. I met Warner one day. First time I met Warner, I was flying Gordy Zimmerman's Satavia. And I came in really high when I was controlling. And he cleared me to land, and Satavia's got no, no flaps. So I had to side stuff it in. And I knew Warner was watching, and I didn't know him, but I knew him from the tower, and I knew what people said about him. So I got it in. And I got a, a attaboy from Warner. I said, where are you going? I'm going to the coffee shop. And at this time, there was one over we uh, on the side of the museum, just a little hole in the wall coffee shop. He walked in. <coughs> 20 minutes later, I walked over and introduced myself. And that started a 45 year relationship. Anyway, to get on with it. The museum. We all look at the museum over there. Well, it was nothing but a dirty old hangar back in the day in the 80s. And it, the, the museum was in uh, Delta. They, uh, they decided to move to Langley, and they moved in, and the dirty old hangar had a, a paved floor, and I mean asphalt. You know what asphalt does over time? So you couldn't, it, it wasn't good for anything. And Werner had a relationship with Jerry St. Germain, uh, who at that time was a senator. And we got Jerry involved, said, we need to raise some money. Fix up the museum. So. By the time we got finished, Jerry had figured out how he could manipulate his way through the federal government, and we had 100 grand. So we paved the inside of the, or didn't pave, we put concrete floor in the, in the hangar. We paved the backyard, which was just a mud hole when we started out, built a fence around it, and that's what you get today. And, uh, <coughs> And then we were all, all of us were uh, quite involved with the museum. We used to fly all the museum airplanes. They don't do that anymore, but we used to take you know, four or five biplanes out every weekend. If there was a fly-in within 100 miles of Vancouver, we'd go as a group, take all the planes out, and go fly in. And, uh, Werner was always the leader. Uh, he had to be the leader. But we never did tell him that we always put the worst pilot out in the front. He'd <laughs> 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 do anything for anybody, and I would venture to say that there is a, a, a pilot in this room that lives in the Langley Airport that hasn't borrowed a tool, got a part, got advice. Just, he was always there to help everybody. Okay, that's, I think that's all I really got to say. But that, that, all I want to get across was you didn't even have to know order to get help from one. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, Mike's going to get up here. He's got a, a tribute to read from a while, somebody that really wanted to be here but couldn't uh, attend the physics. So come on up, Mike. And are you, you're going to read this one? I thought you were going to read it.